Hello everyone, I'm Ariel with Urban Asia, a case to explore in the world cities, its history, food, and culture. And today we are on a warship, the HMS Belfast, with Nairi Bushel. Uh, tell us, what is the HMS Belfast and uh, why is it here in the middle of London? It's not the sort of place you'd expect to find a warship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she is a, a Second World War cruiser. So she's very old. She's actually the largest object owned by the Imperial War Museum. So she's an important object in our museum collection, but she's also something that you can climb all over, explore, go along nine decks of this ship. And the reason she's in London is because she's the last big gunned armoured warship in the whole of Europe from the Second World War. And so you can she's see the really guns like right there. They are yeah. the biggest guns looming wow. above us. <laughs> <laughs> so she was brought to London as a museum ship uh, to kind of celebrate the fact that she had had this incredible service and to represent that story for visitors. Oh, cool. All right, let's jump into it. Let's get a little, we're going to go all around the ship and discover all the little stories inside of it and the history of it. All right. Absolutely. <laughs> Now we're on the quarter deck. So this is actually a wooden deck on a steel really? ship. So um, the, the Navy in Britain, many hundreds of years ago, all used to be built out of wood. But um, by the time of the Second World War, it's a steel ship that they are constructing. And we talked about those big guns above us. They are the six inch guns. Wow. And when they're fired, they would fire a shell, a large bullet, 14 miles away. So she packed a pretty powerful punch when she was um, in service. But underneath the guns, shining there in the sunlight, we've got the ship's bell. And that's one of the most important objects we actually have on board. And let me stop you right there. Let me see if I'm picking up your audio. Oh, whoa. What is that bell again? So the bell is a gift from the city of Belfast. So just across the Irish Sea, the city of Belfast is home to a really famous shipyard called Harland and Wolf. Not so famous that everyone's probably heard of it actually, but I can guarantee that your viewers will have heard of one of the ships that they built, and that was the Titanic. Oh. So Titanic and HMS Belfast were both built in that city, and that's the crest of the city of Belfast and this is a gift to the ship from that city. But what I really like about it is visitors might not notice that underneath and inside there's another story that this bell reveals because there are names. We can take a look. If you can zoom in there, you've got lots and lots of different names from lots of different eras. Lindsay so, Sarah, James Owen, Clive Williams. Uh, recent dates, 99, 97. Yeah, so all different dates, which I quite like. The ship has a very long history. So there's one here from 1949, and it's all these dates, all these names represent children of officers who'd served on board the Belfast. And these children have been baptized in a religious ceremony where the bell has actually been taken off the mount tipped upside down and filled with water which was blessed by the priest. The ship had her own priest sailing on board as a member of the crew and the children were baptised in this as the font and so the name would be engraved as a, a, a memorial of that event um, and it's one of those hidden stories that visitors yeah, if you look closely yeah. on the Belfast, there's all sorts of hidden stories. And, uh, are most of the kids uh, children of uh, people in the military? Yes, mm -hmm. and in fact, on um, Remembrance Sunday, so the 11th of November every year, we have a service on board to commemorate those who have fallen in all wars. And uh, some of the children who came on board this year were, or last year rather, were the grandchildren of a veteran from the Second World War and they had been baptised because they'd got special permission because of that, that connection to the ship. It's beautiful. I want to show a little bit more. It's a beautiful bell. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's nice and chelly. <laughs> Did you want to walk inside? Yeah, let's keep on going inside, yeah. 
Uh, so here is it's wooden right here. This little lobby. No, the, the oh the wood. Yeah. Uh, yes, so the actual um, deck. <laughs> the deck is um, is beautiful teak wood and this bar is actually quite significant because if you were an officer on board so if you think of when you were at school you've got teachers they would be the equivalent of the officers and the students are the ratings on a ship and at the top of the school would be the head teacher and that's the captain on the ship so that's our hierarchy on board to um, to be allowed Oh, Wait there we the go. <laughs> <laughs> to, um, That's when you know you're in a ship when you hear announcements <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> Colours will actually be the hoisting of the flag, so you might want to oh, really? film the. What is this? So, um, did you say one minute or five minutes? Five minutes. Five minutes they'll they'll hoist the um, the ensign, but the bar to go across onto the quarter deck you had to be invited by an officer if you were a rating. So this is very much um, a dividing line yeah, demarcation of where the, where the sailors are allowed to move depending on their rank and their position on board. So and is officer anyone above a certain rank? An officer is anyone who is in a very smart jacket with, with gold. So either gold buttons or gold braiding around the cuff. So the ratings uniforms were sort of navy blue jackets with little blue collars, very traditional. And the officers, they have all the, they called it scrambled eggs. So the more <laughs> scrambled egg you had on your cuff, the higher up you were, the more power and authority you wielded on the ship. But if you were a good officer, you were respectful of your men and you were, you know, to be a good leader, you were someone who kind of tried to bring, bring those men with you and, and treat everyone well. And then you're more likely to get, get things done. So Belfast was known as a happy ship because generally her captain and her officers were, were really good people, um, leaders of people. And this is uh, already 80 years old, the ship. The ship is 80 years old. Wow. In she fact, look a day over 40. Oh, she's, she'll, she'll <laughs> love you for saying that. <laughs> the ship is actually going to be 80 um, on the 17th of March. Oh, wow. This year it's her birthday. So it's a very significant date because most ships are considered old when they reach 30. Yeah. So to get to 80 is incredible. And so we're having a big celebration with some of our veterans, one of whom is 104. And he lived here in the Second World War. And I'll tell you a story about John Harrison when we get to a, a significant part of the ship for him. But he is going to return. And I believe there's going to be a very large birthday cake and John will have the honour as the oldest surviving member of the ship's crew. He will cut the cake with a sword as is Navy <laughs> tradition. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> it is really cool. And uh, so here on the, like, uh, what would people be doing here on a daily basis going through this deck? <sighs> Hmm. So, life on board wasn't always dramatic and about being in war. A lot of the time, daily life on board would involve what we call bright work. So, polishing, yeah. making the this ship. This is a very well polished ship, you can see from all the, the details on the ship. It looks very clean and, and kept up. Yeah, we try and maintain that sort of standard. It's a bit harder these days because when there was a crew of 950 men on board, that's a lot of hands on deck to do the, to do the work. But they would have been polishing the brass. They would have swabbed the decks. So this wooden deck would have required a lot of cleaning um, and special care. Shark skin apparently was a really good material to get dirt off, but also protect the wood. Did they use shark skin for, uh, for Shark skin for the, for the deck and um, polish for the brass. And there would often be um, an announcement that might say, all hands to paint ship. So if they were going into port, um, this is particularly after the Second World War when the ship was still in service and she was sailing around the world to represent Britain in different parts of, of the globe. They would often be painting ship to make sure she looked tiddly. And tiddly was the sailor's nickname for tidy, neat, really, really well presented. And Belfast was known as a tiddly ship. They were quite proud of proud of their vessel. And actually, before we continue, like uh, let's name the like the huge moments of history that the Belfast has been in, including D-Day. Yeah, including D-Day. In fact, if we just have a little yeah, look at her honors board. So there are, um, there are several actions 
that the ship was involved in. So she has a really long service from 1939 right the way through to 1962. And this is the equivalent of seeing a veteran with the medals on their chest proudly displayed when they're, when they're on parade. This is the ship's equivalent. So she was involved in the Arctic in 1943. Wow. And within that service, she fought the last traditional naval battle. If you think of battles of old, big ships trying to outmaneuver each other and fire at each other. North Cape. Oh, there you go. Ooh, they'll colors. probably say colors. Where do the colors appear? They appear on the mast, on the staff just uh, there. Are you doing colors, Abdul? No, it's um, purple. So you should see the... Um, the colours come up for the mast, which is very good timing. <laughs> uh, and, oh, does the Union Jack fly? So the Union Jack will fly at the other end of the ship, at the bow. We're actually at the stern. This is the stern, okay. Uh, and what's the, for people who don't know any <laughs> naval uh, Funny terms. vocabulary? <laughs> so the stern the is the back of the ship or the blunt end if you want to be civilian about it and the pointy end is the bow and I try to explain that to people by saying you bow forwards so the forward part of the ship is the bow. It always sails forward. It moment. always sails forward yeah or unless you're in real danger and you're trying to get out of trouble. Is it possible to go reverse? Oh uh, yeah it's possible to reverse her and she's one that when she was built she was one of the fastest ships in the navy. She could go about 35 miles an hour in civilian wow. terms so she was an incredibly quick but powerful ship and that's what cruisers are. They balance the power, the ability to protect herself with heavy armour and the speed as well, which makes her quite unique for so combining all those. From a battleship? Yeah, a she's larger. smaller. Okay. She's a mean think of her as a medium sized ship. The battleships are the really big ones. Yeah. <laughs> I mean they depict that in sci fi movies also with a huge ship like in Star Wars, the huge ship yeah. the Battle Star. Yeah. The Death Star and then the, the smaller ones are the cruisers there. Yeah. Getting close to the planet. Absolutely. And that those terms all come from things like the Navy. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so so the Union Jack went on. And what's that white flag underneath? So this is the white ensign, so it's got a Union flag in the corner and then it's white predominantly with a big red cross and the white ensign, whether you were a cruiser, a battleship, a destroyer, a smaller ship in the Navy, every Royal Naval ship would have flown the white ensign. So it's, it's a huge honour actually for the Belfast to still be able to fly her ensign because she's no longer a serving warship. We have special permission to be able every morning to hoist the white ensign here and every evening at sunset the flag is lowered respectfully and then popped away until the next morning. And that's a tradition done on any Royal Naval ship anywhere in the world even to this day. It's, yeah, it's a really... It's a beautiful view with the Tower Bridge over here and everything. And so, um, why is it here in London still? Uh, or right now? Um, Rather than, uh, in, where do ships go? After where do retire? ships go? Yeah. Most ships go to the knackers yard. Most ships okay. get sold. They, uh, they might get sold to other navies who, although they're too old to serve in the Royal Navy, another navy might still have a use for them, or particularly as a training ship. But sadly, for most ships of Belfast era, they were um, reduced to disposal and scrapped. And that is the official term for being broken up and, and thrown away. So Belfast is a really rare survivor. And the reason she's in London is down to her last admiral, um, a man called Morgan Morgan Giles. So good, Perfect. they named him twice. <laughs> and Morgan Morgan Giles realized that Belfast that was, she was down in Portsmouth, down in the south of England. She was reduced to disposal prior to being scrapped. And he went to Parliament just up the river and he said, you can't, yeah. ca you cannot get rid of this ship. She is the last one of her type in Europe from the Second World War. And to represent that story, you need to save the ship. And he argued so successfully, the government agreed with him. And she was brought here to London. She sailed through Tower Bridge, so it opened to its widest extent to let her squeeze oh, through. And she's here 
Well, for two reasons. We're in the deepest part of the Thames. Because it can't go further. And also there's a bridge that doesn't open. So, <laughs> so we've come as far as we could possibly go before we hit London Bridge. And we're in nice deep water because she's still afloat. So when visitors step aboard, oh. you are still floating. So we still have to have our sea legs. You still it? have to have your sea legs. I like your terminology. <laughs> you still need your sea legs. So not too bad. We do go up and down with the tide because this is a tidal river but she's such a, a big, heavy ship that you don't need to worry about taking travel sickness pills too yeah, much. Course, you yeah. should be okay. And just to, to, to uh, put into context, this is a museum open for, for people, to the public. Yeah, this is the funny thing. She's an object yes. and she's a museum. So <laughs> you can clamber everywhere. In fact, I love that. I love that when you climb a ladder, you are going up and down exactly as the sailors would have done all those years ago. When you go through a hatch and have to duck under a doorway, you're going through something that all those men would have gone through. So you can explore and really get a feel for what it was like to be on board as one of those sailors. Amazing. All right, let's go inside. Let's go inside. Come inside where the atmosphere changes slightly because we are now very much inside a working ship. So a lot of visitors when they come aboard, the first thing they notice is the smell. It does smell. To me, it smells like a public school in, in the U.S. <laughs> uh, it has an old wood smell to it. Old, distinctive, yeah. yeah. Many years of oil and paint and things uh -huh. that have seeped into the, into the steel. Um, but if we come, there's background noise from the torpedo film. Hi, morning, William. Yes. That's one of the things that surprises people. I think you come inside from that big open quarter deck area, suddenly everything shrinks and you're in these really narrow passageways and that's when it, it seems so strange that 950 men would have lived here. 950 men in the Second World War. And that's and when visitors. One of those men, I mean, one of the people who wanted to be one of the men here was uh, Winston Churchill. <laughs> he did. <laughs> for for D-Day invasion. <laughs> yeah, you've done your research. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Let's get into that story. So you actually wanted to board the Belfast for, for D-Day. So the ship, yeah, Belfast was um, was a really significant ship at D-Day because she was going to be the, or she was the. Yeah, do you want an interesting background? Um, or in fact, we could do that story in the Admiral's quarters yeah. where he would have stayed. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah if he'd been on board. Should we go there? Yeah, let's, let's go there, go there now. Awesome. <laughs> because I'm trying to think the best place to do that. Yeah, it's probably if he'd managed to have his way. Oh, <laughs> um, so here's the layout of the ship. So yes. And how many levels does the ship have, the cruiser? So there are nine decks of the, of the ship and she's changed a lot. So the three representations here are how she was in different eras of her life. So I like to think of Belfast as a bit of an archaeological dig. So when you come aboard, there are parts of her as she was in the Second World War. And then there were parts of her that got modernized for the 1950s. And in the 1960s, there was another kind of bit of a, a rebuild of, oh. of different aspects of it. So Just like ancient buildings where you can see Yeah, different, uh, different uh, levels. Yeah, like going sort of to Roman London and medieval yeah. London and then modern London yeah. on top. <laughs> oh, that's cool. All right. Okay, so if we um, go past the chapel. Nice, chapel. And the little mail room. And the workshop. Hi, Andy. I'll point all these out because then if you want to come back to any of them later, um, there's a laundry. <laughs> places it feels so cinematic because a lot of movies are like the generals walking through the hallways yes uh, talking about the strategy that's about to Belfast happen. has been used in quite a few films really? um, oh, in yeah. fact Which one? um the most, recent? the most recent one is a Bollywood film yeah they filmed the ship as um so she was acting the part 
of um, a, an Indian warship. Oh. And um, she, <laughs> the, the story was actually a, basically a true story. Um, and the, the captain of the ship, while he was away, his wife had an affair. Yeah. He returns back home. He murders the, um, the guy that she's been having. Yeah, total scandal. <laughs> and then he goes to the police and hands himself in. And he oh. says, I've just done this. And, um, and it's about him sort of proving all the defense of the case and politics in India. It doesn't sound very Bollywood, but oh, <laughs> the, so the ship was in the opening scenes. <laughs> so coming down the ladder, if you come down backwards and face the ladder um, and just try and have at least one hand. <laughs> Do, do not slide down for anyone watching. Yeah, we have them. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I say to the kids. It's like you have to be trained as a sailor before you can do that. Hello, how are you? Yeah, I'm all right. How oh, are you? good. That's the other thing to avoid the big catch steps. So. So. Yes, yeah, it takes a while to, to know your way around. Ah, this is brilliant. Now you might want to film the, the door plate. The Admiral's quarters. And who was the Admiral during uh, World War II? You... So Admiral Burnett was our Admiral and Captain Parham was captain of the ship um, for D-Day. And they had an excellent working relationship. Um, so the ship was um, was to be the flagship of Bombardment Force E. So at D-Day, this ship was going to lead in a whole load of other warships that were going to bombard the coast and try and knock out as many German defences as possible so those fighting soldiers that were landing in those tiny ships, wave after wave, had a chance of getting onto the beaches and starting the invasion of Europe and bringing the end of the Second World War about. So that was the role of the ship. Now, Churchill knew that this was going to be a pretty dramatic yeah. event. And being a man who liked history and liked to think lines. about his place in history, he decided that he was going to go to D-Day on the flagship of Bombardment Force E, HMS Belfast. And Churchill was not a man to be dissuaded lightly from decisions. So he was really determined that he was going to do this. The Navy were horrified. The military planners no knew. No, and no one knows that D-Day is going to work. No one knows that this is not. This is a terribly dangerous operation, and to have the Prime Minister on one of the forward leading ships was a huge risk. Especially so, if, uh, the Germans or any of the Axis powers found out. They absolutely. Could the ship directly. Yeah, because in wartime you're always worried about intelligence leaks and you know getting the Prime Minister there. That's that's another factor in in a already very complicated operation. So the only way they could think to dissuade Churchill was to get the king involved. And the king actually does something incredibly clever. And he says, this is a great idea, Winston. Oh, really? <laughs> if you're going to go, I'm going to go too. And at that point, Winston Churchill realizes he can't risk the king no. being at D-Day. And so he says, I won't go. And then the king says, well, oh, that's fine. I won't go either. So it was a really clever piece of manoeuvring oh, to psychology. <laughs> yeah, reverse psychology. So if he had come on board, this is where he oh, would have stayed. So do you mind the hatch as you come in. But mm. this is where the Admiral lives mm. during times when the ship is in port. So you've got his lovely dining room where he might invite the captain and other officers mm. to dine with him. And through the door is his office and sitting room. Oh, cool. And can we walk in Absolutely. There? Have a look. So if... Is there an animal still in charge of the ship? No. We, um, we now are a full museum. So we don't have oh, any yeah. naval um, oversight at all. So what was the last time there was a naval oversight here? 1962. Oh, so her oh, final... Oh. A long time ago, her final... Um, 
cruise around the world. I like to think of it as just one extended long summer holiday for the sailors because <laughs> they did just circumnavigate the globe and go to some very nice places like New Zealand and Tanzania. I think they deserve it for all the great job they did. Yeah, yeah, they certainly thought so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what are these medals all depicted here? So these ones are different. So this is probably the, the nicest one because this is actually Admiral Burnett. So he, he was at wartime admiral, and it's him that would have been moved out of this part of the ship to make way for Churchill. <laughs> so probably he was quite relieved that he didn't have the responsibility of the prime minister on board in well, Norway. A lot of pressure. A bit and of he pressure. did a great job during D-Day. Yes. The, um, it was a successful invasion. It was very successful. Belfast um, was one of the first ships to open fire. Not the first, as is sometimes um, believed. Second, in fact. And um, she bombarded the coastline. And the troops that she was protecting were British and Canadian. So it was a really nice example of the Commonwealth, or the Empire, as it was then, fighting together to try and secure that second front. So, um, so Belfast fires, and um, fires for about a month after D-Day, so D-Day plus 30-ish, the troops have made it so far inshore that those big guns now don't reach the German defences. She would be firing on her own men. So that's when Belfast leaves the D-Day operation to the army and, and actually comes back, back to Britain and is then prepared for sailing to the, um, to the Pacific. So and what do you do in the Pacific? Fortunately, no fighting. Mm. By the time she sails, the, um, it would have been a huge fleet. She would have fought alongside American warships. But by the time she sails, the atomic bomb is dropped. That brings about the end of the war. Mm. And one of the things that she does do is moor in Shanghai and throws a children's party, which is when her story uh, becomes even more diverse. So in Shanghai, they have been loving this ship for, for decades. For decades, <laughs> absolutely. She's always been home to, like <laughs> to the all sorts of things. Of, of, uh, Britain. That's a really nice way of putting <laughs> that it. Mother. Is it. Is it a she? She's is a she. she? Okay. Yep. We don't know why either. Warships in Britain have always been referred yeah, to as, as she. <laughs> is it the same in America yeah. as well? Oh, that's always really good. Always a she. Mm. And it's just one of those lovely traditions. I think uh, the other uh, powers in World War II usually refer to it as a he. Uh, Russia and Germany, I think so. Ah, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I know that um, I, I've learned something now, though, so I didn't know America did it as well. That's yeah. really good. Because <laughs> I think the sailors, yeah, they, they like to to think of them as like their mothers protecting them. And, mm -hmm. um, but for these children, they were in Shanghai because they'd been captured by the Japanese at the start oh. of the war and interned. So civilian internees with their families had been in captivity for the length of the war. And yeah. Belfast decided... Which was depicted in the film uh, Empire of the Sun. Yes, yeah. absolutely. In fact, he was one of the... Um, oh, I can't remember his name now, but he was the one of the guys the the, okay. who wrote the story, the book that that film was based oh, on. Okay. Ballard was his surname. He was one of these children that came on board the ship because the, the crew decided to throw a party for the children. Oh. And they put a swing on the upper deck and another one on the crane and they had swings for the children. Mm -hmm. There's a lovely photo of two little children meeting our diver in his big suit, and they had lots of chocolate, and the bakers actually baked lots of sticky buns, and those children had that party on board as a sort of, you're free, the internment is over, um, and things are going to improve for you now that the war has ended. So that was something right. that Belfast did at the end of the war, rather than fortunately having to fight in, and the, in and the Pacific. And sub subsequently in the Korean War. And then was back in action in the Korean War, mm. absolutely. Again, fighting alongside the Americans um, as a, it was a United Nations operation. Was that the last ever instance of uh, battle? That was her last firing of her mm. guns in anger, yeah. Um, and actually it's when the ship sustained quite a lot of damage. So D-Day, she survives completely unscathed. But in the mm. Korean War, we actually lose four crew members when a mm. shell hits the ship, smashes through the side and bursts a hot water pipe oh. and four um, sailors were actually killed as a result of that. So we lose more casualties in the Korean War than we did at something like D-Day. Interesting. Mm. Oh, wow, beautiful. Uh, beautiful space, really. Yeah.
yeah, not uh, not what the average sailor enjoys yeah. on board. <laughs> um, Who would usually hang out in this room? It would be the Admiral. Would he? You said he invited people as well. Yes. Yeah, so the Admiral. Um, being in authority in the ship is actually quite a lonely position to be in. So the Admiral would be here and other officers, they had other places that they would dine, um, a bit like a common room at school. Did he have like a second commander or like a group of people? If he wanted to invite them to dinner, they okay. would have formal dinners here. So or he might... Be here. No, no, all of this space, this generous <laughs> amount of space is for one man. His bedroom was through this door here. Uh -huh. So this is his home on board. Um, when when the ship's not in action, he's got another little home nearer to where the um, to the bridge, which we could have a little look at later. Yeah. Um, but if he invites other officers th to dine, then this would be filled with with lots of food and maybe a bit of naval rum as well at the end of the meal. <laughs> Any Sunday roasts? Here? Sunday roasts, yeah. <laughs> um, there's a famous story of a reindeer being served up oh, really? as part of roast dinner. Oh, um, that's cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not so much for the reindeer. <laughs> um, after, after the Battle of North Cape, we looked at those battle honours earlier, and the Battle of North Cape... Um, Where is that? North that's Cape? up off the coast of Norway, so... Oh, Oh, that's where they got the reindeer. That's where they got the reindeer, as a gift from the Russians. Oh, really? <laughs> so obviously, that's what you give a ship, a reindeer. Um, so the Russians... Very tasty, I, I <laughs> that. Oh, so the sailors thought, because she was served up as their Christmas dinner. Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, there was lots of, lots of different meals eaten down here. But the Admiral could also extend the um, invitation to other captains and admirals of ships serving with Belfast. Mm. So often um, little boats would come would across. Would be Admiral's dinners? Where would be Admiral's be dinners, yeah. Admirals? Absolutely, oh. yeah. So it might, it might just be a social occasion or it might be to seriously get people together to discuss how they're going to sail for the next convoy, if they're going through the Arctic convoys, or just to get everyone together, sort of rally the spirits before something like D-Day. Oh, so yeah, Check important meeting. Okay, so again, mind this big step over. Mind the gap. <laughs> mind your head. Mind your shins. Yes, you so many things to here. mind on the Belfast. <laughs> Our kids encouraged to come to this museum? Absolutely. In fact, they can sleep on board. Oh, oh really? That is interesting. We, is that event or, um, we have sleepover accommodation. Oh, wow. So every night of the year, it is possible for schools and youth groups to book a kip in a ship. Oh, I love that. And they actually sleep in real sailors' bunks from the 1950s. And get to experience what it's like to live in a mess deck and sort of leading you through <laughs> over lots of hatches um, and down narrow passageways. So they get to experience all aspects really, what it's like to explore the ship and get lost and try and find your way again. And then what it's like to actually sleep on board in a room where you've got lots of other people. Um, so that's, that can be really, really fun, but it can also be quite tiring because not everyone wants to go to sleep. <laughs> so up this ladder again. Oh, climbing up is a lot easier than Yes. <laughs> How are you, William? Oh, I'm great, yeah. Good kids. <laughs> this is William. It's one of the reasons yeah, the ship so looks cool. so good. <laughs> <laughs> It's an interesting place to have a cleaning job, isn't it? It's like, I'm going to clean a warship. <laughs> we were admiring your bright work outside. <laughs> so, like, uh, what would happen in, in uh, these hallways, that were, corridors that we're walking through right now? So, in, <laughs> this one, this in is... In a war situation. In a war situation, yeah. we're actually underneath those big guns. Oh, so, when we first... So, it would be loud here when they're... It firing. would be incredibly loud and everything would be shaking a lot. And there'd be a lot of dust and possibly your mouse or rat falling out from the, uh, the trunking <laughs> every Did time the ship fired. Into? There was a big problem with rats and mice. When you tie up... Uh, to port yeah. and you provision the ship so you get all those food supplies on board 
up the ropes would come mice and rats. So one of our veterans, Ted Hill, he was a stoker. He worked in the engine rooms and he remembers mice and rats running up the ropes to get on board. So as That's well as the crew, the had we have an issue with rats and mice in the war. And so there were three cats here in oh. the Second World War as members of the crew and they had the job of catching the mice and the rats. Oh, so amazing. everyone here has a job. Were they really trained? <laughs> they had to be good ratters and, and yeah. good yeah, good at uh, similar to as how dogs are trained in, by the military? Yeah, so, they were oh. sort of yeah, encouraged to, to so they wouldn't be fed oh, sort wow. of as much food, you know, and hopefully they would eat lots of mice and rats. Oh, and wow. <laughs> so um, would uh, the soldiers need to use like um, Ear guards in order to like. <laughs> Health and safety wasn't quite what it was, um, what well, it is today. That. So, a lot of our ex gunners are a little bit deaf mm -hmm. um, because they were given not ear defenders, but you could pop little, um, almost like cotton wool. It's, yeah, it's a gesture towards your hearing protection, but really it's, it's not going to, to help at all. Um, so. But the guns are actually, this is the. This guns. cylinder is the barbette, so the guns that loomed above us slot into the ship. So that's what would be happening um, in this area. And in fact, we can go and see where the shells were kept because they make their journey up from deep down inside the ship to those gun barrels up there. So we can see the both nice. ends of the of the procedure. <laughs> There's so much. I realise I'm like jumping all over the place. It's like we can go and see this, we can go and see that. <laughs> this is actually quite nice. It's got about half an hour. Half an hour, perfect. So let's go. Did you want to see the shell rooms? Uh, yeah, yeah. Wherever where you think there's a cool story that you really enjoy telling. <gasps> there's so much. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, very intrigued by the shells. The shells. Um, this is a torpedo. So on our way to the shell room, this is this is a ship killer, really. So this is what you fire when you've got your enemy target in range, and these go under the water. Absolutely. Something visitors see on board is we try and use lots of archive footage where possible. So the museum has a great wealth for film and photography from the Second World War. Amazingly, it was considered important for photographers to come on board in wartime and capture what the Navy was doing. And this would be shown to people back in cinemas in Britain um, and photographs in the newspapers to show people what the Navy were up to and how they were helping the war effort. It's good because uh, I know I have a lot of family in the military, in the American military, and they would study up on uh, history a whole lot they become officers so they will know about military history and then we inform them on strategies they can use um, in any war scenario absolutely there's um there's a lot to be learned from previous naval battles and strategy and mm -hmm. tactics and i know the u.s navy are really proud of their naval history um i visited the constitution oh. in um in boston and Staying on board at the time I was there were some newly trained officer cadets mm -hmm. and they were learning the history of the sort of Civil War era and, um, and taking this incredible ship out oh. and operating the guns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, right, so shell rooms. Uh, I know, I realise I'm whizzing you past. The kitchen, right? The, <laughs> the kitchen, okay. <laughs> some special treats. So I'm going to do that in the mess deck okay, right, if perfect. you want to, but we could so introduce food. Yeah. Um, okay, so don't worry, these have not been forgotten men from the <laughs> yeah, Second like, World War. Oh, <laughs> There's so many potatoes to peel, they've been here since 1943. <laughs> <laughs> but they are wearing what would have been worn in this Space because we are now at the back of the galley. And the galley is the name for a kitchen on board. And peeling spuds and onions was a task that had to be done every day to yeah. try and feed all these men. 
Um, it could actually be a punishment as well. One of the things the captain had as a responsibility was to keep his crew well disciplined. So there was a court system whereby if you were caught doing something wrong, like theft or fighting, you would be brought before the captain and he would decide whether you deserve to be punished for that particular crime. So a minor misdemeanor might find you peeling onions um, or washing up. And if we come through the galley, you can see these huge, big vats. So think of your saucepan at home. We've got mushy peas, we've got custard for dessert and we've got a, a kind of 24-hour operation to keep the men well fed and one of these all the time had boiling water in because for British sailors a cup of tea is a vital thing to have yeah. so at any time of the day or night men could come and collect water for making tea back in their mess so decks. Tea, not coffee. Tea, not coffee, or lime juice, which is why the Americans call us limeys, because way down under our feet in the engine and boiler rooms, it's super hot down there. And so the men, to keep hydrated, would have lime juice available. And that's where the nickname comes from. <laughs> limeys. <laughs> limeys. So thanks to the Americans. But that's, um, yes, this is a galley. In the 1950s, in the Korean War, a bit like the school canteen, you would bring your tray along the outside and get served by these rather fine gentlemen. <laughs> My grandfather was a cook in the Korean War, oh, uh, in the American military. Wow. Uh, so, so it's kind of cool being in the space. He would have done something like this. He became an excellent cook as a result because he learned how to cook things so quickly. A lot of our sailors say that actually, that when they went back into civilian life, they knew how to cook, they knew how to do their laundry, they knew how to sew buttons back on things. So they were really quite self-sufficient because the Navy had taught these men all these skills. So I wonder if my, if my grandfather like fixed clothes for me. Absolutely. Also. <laughs> Every man had what's called a housewife, a husif, and that was their own personal sewing kit. And there were make, do and mend afternoons when the sailors would have time to make, do and mend. Oh, that's amazing. All right. All right, so that's kitchen ticked off. Um, mind the little step. <laughs> You're watching this on the Ariel with your classes from the kitchen to the world series. It's history from the culture. If you want to see more videos like this, like our page. And if you want to share this video with your friends and family, show them all the cool military history of London. Share this video with them. And we're going to keep walking through the beach in this. <laughs> we are. This is when you realize that she's quite a big ship. <laughs> it's so massive. Uh, so, like, would, uh, would uh, a normal soldier usually see a, a huge portion of the ship? Uh, no, uh, a sailor? Oh, that's a really interesting question, actually, because when visitors come on board, they often find that they get lost. Yeah. And I say to them, don't worry the sailors got lost too because they wouldn't know where they worked they would know where they lived and this is a mess deck from the second world war and they would know the way between those two points the rest of the ship you might never go to the boiler or engine rooms you might never go up to the bridges because you didn't have a reason to go there yeah. so if you get lost as a visitor that's fine that's what the sailors did so you're having an authentic experience <laughs> but talking of uh, where they they lived this is uh, mess deck though it wasn't messy because once a week there would be inspections to make sure that you were living in an orderly fashion and a ship-shaped fashion and you would eat at these benches with your messmates so a group of eight sailors who lived together and worked together you messed in branches so your same job that you did so if you were all stokers in the engine room you all lived together if you were all bakers and cooks, you would all live together as well. That's how they created camaraderie. Absolutely, yeah, you should really get along. And these men became like family, um, in fact. And what we can see... Um, these men have tattoos. Um, they did. Representing their battalion or... There were tattoos um, that you might have, yeah, representing your branch that you worked in or something patriotic or 
Um, or where they visited also, right? Where they visited um, as, as sort of, yeah, maybe souvenirs or things that reflect superstitions. So you might have mermaids or anchors or swallows. So different naval traditions that go back hundreds of years um, for, for tattoos. But yeah, it's a popular it's a popular thing for the sailors to do. This is a very noisy environment, so it must have been tough to sleep in uh, these hammocks over here at night. That's one of the challenges, I think, is you've got men who are trying to sleep. You've got men whose shift patterns mean that they're on a meal break. And there are other men working. So there would be footsteps going over the top of the oh, deck. Yeah head there would be machinery working we've got the sound of the trunking the air conditioning on at the moment so all of this noise meant that sleeping was quite a challenge but you just had to to get along as best you could um, try and be considerate of other people and in the second world war they were so exhausted that actually sleeping wasn't wasn't a problem because you would just fall back into bed especially in the arctic a lot of the time they would keep their woolly jumpers, the long socks on and just fall into standard their hammock. Issue, uh, sweaters. Standard they issue are, sweaters. Are now, like, very popular amongst young I believe young they people. are a hipster type yeah. of clothing. Yeah, you see the Royal Navy trendsetters. <laughs> I did notice your very shiny yeah. buttons and that's what um, the sailors would do as part of their, uh -huh. their life in here would be to polish up and make sure they looked presentable. So although it's called a mess deck, it was kept tidy and neat and they would have themselves kept themselves tidy and neat as well and pops it stowed, I should say, put things away, stowed away items into their lockers and into the cupboards behind. So everything has a place, everything was neat and tidy. Um, oh, is this where you wanted to try a bit of naval yes, cuisine? Let's try it. Let's try some <laughs> naval cuisine. So, so we're going to try some naval cuisine. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> so, decide for some mushy peas or some potatoes. Oh, if only, <laughs> or some nice corned beef hash. But actually. <laughs> What we've got is known as hardtack. Oh, so the these are ship's biscuits. Ship's biscuits, oh wow. And these... <laughs> oh my God. This is more like a loaf of bread. <laughs> they're kind of bread substitute. So if the ship is in battle and the cooks are not cooking, everyone's got a job to do when the yeah. ship's in battle. This is sort of food backup. So these are your rations that are going to get you through. So they're very solid. Mm -hmm. They're called hard tack for a reason. Um, wow, okay. I'm going to just <laughs> knock one against the locker. And would one dip this into tea? Or? So the best way to eat this is actually, yeah, dip it into tea mm -hmm. or put it into your soup or your stew and it soaks up some of the liquid oh, and good. becomes a little bit softer. But they're pretty good to eat as they are. Well, let's try it out. <laughs> <laughs> Very hard. They're very hard. Yeah, that's where the nickname comes from. Your ship's biscuit, more like hard tack. <laughs> but it's filling. Mm. Wow. Sustaining. This is going to take a while to eat. <laughs> <laughs> You're four oh. hours on shift. <laughs> we'll grab some tea later and dip it. <laughs> and dip it in. Yeah, I think they're actually really, really nice. <laughs> so we'll leave those there. Because the next place I want to show you is where you might be finding your ship's biscuit is, is absolutely vital because the ship might be at action, you're in battle, no one is cooking because men like the bakers would have worked down where we're going to next. Ooh, all right, let's and do this. So we've got lots of, I think we've got three ladders down. <laughs> Alicia, are we before opening times? So it feels we're in the shell room, so I don't want to go to that one because okay. it might be a bit quieter. So to put the jigsaw together, when we first came on board, we saw the barrels of the biggest guns on yeah. the ship. 
We then saw that curved bulkhead, that curved wall where we came inside the ship and now we're at the base of that. So we are in the shell rooms and the reason this is kept down here is because these are high explosives. So you try and keep these safe, not anymore, so you can rest assured that coming on board you are in no danger at all. And this is now part of the museum that is open to the public. Absolutely, it's open oh, to the public. Open. Oh, yeah, we make people do those crazy steep ladders <laughs> and they can come in here and they can see where the men work to load these high explosive shells onto these hoists mm -hmm. and then they would be sent through hydraulics to the gun turrets where they would be loaded and fired by the gun crew. It's all about teamwork. So you've got the men down here loading the shells, the men firing, but deep beneath our feet, where we can't go and the public can't go, are the men who are loading the cordite. If you just want to squeeze around. So through this hatch, the cordite is gunpowder. So there would be men in the compartment beneath us loading the cordite onto these tubes as well. So the cordite, the gunpowder, and the shells are both traveling up to be used in the gun turrets. So and is the gunpowder propelling the... Beam? Yes, yeah, the powder is like a big punch mm. behind this. So the reason this travels 14 miles is because there's a big gunpowder punch behind them, sending them on that journey. Um, but what I think is quite revealing is the size of this hatch. We've come through some pretty big hatches. This is a kidney hatch. This is where the men squeeze down. Yeah, everything's got a reason. <laughs> and once they're down there, this hatch is lowered and locked. Oh, wow. At the top of the ladder that we came down, yeah. there's a heavy hatch that was lowered and locked. All the men in these spaces are locked in to make it watertight. So that's why we were talking earlier about those twists and turns of the ship. She is designed to be compartments that can sustain damage in battle. If water was to rip through the side here because we've been hit, one compartment gets flooded, but the rest of the ship say, stays floating, stays fighting. And the, the sailors were trained to do damage control and deal with flooding, deal with fire. Also, then we'd be able to plug holes if necessary. We can plug holes. Those hammocks that we saw above are a pretty useful plug, and they would have been used for oh, that. So hammocks become a, a band-aid on, on a bulkhead. Um, but one of the things that I think is quite um, interesting for visitors to realize are the dangers on board. Yeah. So for the men down here, if the ship sustains so much damage that she starts to sink, it is highly unlikely that the men in the mm -hmm. gunpowder room or these men in the shell room will be able to get out. And I think the reality of those sailors knowing that when they came to action stations makes them incredibly brave individuals. They did their job, they got on with it, and they had to just push that risk to the back of their heads and, and not think about it. Wow, there must have been so much pressure to be inside, no pun intended. Yeah, Victor Padbury was a cook. He was here as a 17-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. And as a cook, he worked in that kitchen we saw but his action station was down in that gunpowder room. And yeah, as an incredible individual, he just had to push that fact that he was working with high explosive on a warship in a battle situation out of his mind and just get on with his job. And were these fragile? Like, um, would they ever mistakenly explode on ship or? The Royal Navy has learnt a lot over the years. Yeah. So by the time of the Second World War, they'd learnt a lot from the First World War when one ship did have a catastrophic fire because they'd put these and the gunpowder right next to the guns because that speeds up the firing process. Yeah, yeah. But it means you're very vulnerable to fire when you've got all this high explosives stacked up. So that's the reason we've got this barbette with the explosives the stored system deep inside the ship and it's safer to the send it up to the guns when it's needed rather than stockpiling up on deck. And what would be the atmosphere here in the middle of uh, the guns firing? Noisy, mm -hmm. incredibly noisy. The ship every time she fires jumps so you've got this incredible sense of the power and force ripping through the ship. The, there's no daylight down here mm -hmm. so you're enclosed 
you can hear the guns firing, but you've no idea what's going on outside. You've no idea how well the battle is going. You only get communicated with when the captain or your gunnery officer feels the need to communicate with you. So the, rate, the uh, telephones just here might ring and you might get orders or instructions or, um, or, or information, but you're very much contained within a box. And I think that adds to the sense of fear that you don't know what's going on, you can't see, you're contained, the noise, the heat of the battle is raging around you. And that's when that camaraderie really matters. The fact that if you've got your, your men with you, you know, you've, you've played cards with, you've eaten together, yeah. I think that helps deal with the pressure of a compartment like this. I think one movie that, that gives to that feeling is Dunkirk that came out last year. Uh, if people want to get that sense of how they probably felt emotionally being inside of here. Yeah, that Dunkirk really looks at that emotional impact of war so well. Mm -hmm. It's a great film. And let's go to one final room to sign off. Okay. Oh gosh, you're going to make me pick one. Yeah. <laughs> Where? Um, okay. What can I offer you? Should we do the bridge? Oh. Okay. Oh, break the equipment. <laughs> this is why I would have made a really bad sailor. <laughs> uh, tuck the, the this inside your pocket. Let's roll it up a bit more. Okay. Uh, so one final space. We could do the bridges. Let's do it. Because we mentioned that um, earlier. I'm trying to think for your <laughs> viewers. We just like throw out random names and things. <laughs> I do love how we trust the public though, like to just deal with ladders and deal with trip hazards and Just lean in as you come up so you don't crack your head on the hatch. Ooh. Is it okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, the bridge is probably good, isn't it? Just to get that final outdoor. The shot out. We're in London, visit us here. <laughs> Did you want to try a ship's biscuit? I really like them. I think there's actually. <laughs> I went up to get them last night from the. There's a specialist boat shop in Char on Shaftesbury Avenue. Actually, there's a good place to go filming. It's owned by a guy who actually sells yachts, and it's been there for hundreds of years. So, yeah. So if you want ship's biscuits, that's where to go. <laughs> All right, so up again. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It's like... Sort of sweet at the end. I've been told that they're not anywhere near as hard as the sailors had to put up with, and I should have double baked them, and then they would get to that sort of rock solid state. Right, this is one big hatch. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so we can end here or we could go up to the bridge. It's entirely up to you. To go to the bridge, yeah. so yeah. we'll take the ladder past the gun turret. Up again. And you could probably feel yourself, you get more confident on the ladders and that's how the sailors mm -hmm. started to move around a little bit quicker because they gradually became more used to... And they're sturdy ladders, aren't they? are pretty sturdy, yeah, she's a pretty sturdy ship. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what, what are their like, uh, naval slangs that people use? Ah, oh, so the Jack Speak, it was called. Okay. So Jack was a, a slang word for a sailor. So Jack Speak is all the funny terms that they had for things on board a ship. And I think part of it is because if you've got that kind of almost baffling secret language, it reinforces that idea of camaraderie. You know, we're yeah. the Navy, we're sailors, we know what we're talking about. Um, so where are we right now? So we saw where the Admiral dined and lived. 
This is where the Admiral worked. So he's the most senior officer on board. He would have sat here and there's not very much else around him. There's a few communication tools, but really the most important thing about this bridge, the Admiral's Bridge, mm -hmm. is the view. Is the view, yeah. So looking across the barrels of the six inch guns, we were just deep down underside them, underneath them. But as we look across, yeah. you can see London and the beautiful River Thames. But the Admiral would have sat here and he would have seen potential danger. And he's thinking all the time about those ships, that group of ships. So if we think of the Arctic convoys, he's got to safely get those ships to Russia. When or was he going through the Arctic? So Russia by 1943 was an ally of mm. Britain and Britain was sending supplies up to her new Russian ally, but not on this ship. This ship, as we've seen, is a, a, a maze of tiny compartments. There's no room for cargo. But what we did have was the big guns to defend the big cargo ships that were taking petrol, tanks, trucks, aeroplanes, 15 million pairs of boots to Russia for their troops to fight the Germans. Mm -hmm. And so those big guns are a bit like sheepdogs looking after a flock of sheep trying to get them yeah. safely to Russia. Who was, uh, who was the enemy? So the enemy is, um, is Germany based in Norway. So mm. as they're sailing up that route to Russia, they are going through they some of the... a blockade from Britain getting access to Norway. Yeah, we've got um, submarines with those torpedoes. So they've got torpedoes too. We've got some pretty big warships that the Germans based in that area and we've got attack potentially from aircraft as well. So there's a three-fold enemy facing those cargo ships and Belfast is equipped to deal with all three of them. Mm. And it's from here that the Admiral chooses his tactics and his strategy. If they come under attack, how are they going to fight? Who are they going to deploy? Are they going to scatter the convoy and tell them to run and fend for themselves as best as possible? Or are they going to gather them in and use the big guns and the anti-aircraft guns to defend the ships. Wow, wonderful. And are guests uh, allowed to sit <gasps> on the Admiral chair? Yeah, we encourage oh. everyone. In fact, would you like to sit yes. on the Admiral chair and be Admiral? Okay. I'll, All right. I'll play cameraman. <laughs> so I'm going to sit on the Admiral chair. This is a pretty special experience. <laughs> I'm going to pretend I see entire fleet of ships. Yeah, there's no uh, London. You've got oh. a fleet, <laughs> fleet around you. No wonder admirals have such great posture on film. Like this, this, this forces you to be always on alert. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. That's a hey. I'm trying to keep really steady and be professional. <laughs> oh, this, uh, this camera is amazing with keeping everything steady. Okay. Uh, oh, amazing. Uh, any other tiny little stories about this uh, bridge? Um, so, um, any other tiny stories about this bridge? Hmm. Uh, so, what is the difference between the cruiser and the destroyer? Was this a... Medium-sized medium -sized ship okay. is a cruiser and the destroyers are smaller. So, they would have fought together. Um, and that's the Admiral's role, really, because those other destroyers haven't necessarily got captains. They're smaller ships, smaller crews, um, and they could be commanded by somebody who might be a lieutenant. So, it's not necessarily under command of a captain. So, the Admiral sitting here has given those men his instructions, his vision for how they're going to fight if they come under attack. And from here, he's going to try and control that battle. Wonderful, that's amazing. And where could people find more information about this museum? So if they want to find out more, we have a website and that's where you can find out when we're open and what it costs to come on board and the other things that you can see um, when, because we've, we've not even seen a third of yeah. this ship. So you can see a lot more as a guest. There's a lot in. more, yeah. Whereas they, we could go on further up to the flag deck and the captain's bridge, further down to the boiler, the engine rooms. And in fact, there's one thing missing from this bridge and that's any steering wheel mm -hmm. and this is where visitors expect to see mm -hmm. a steering wheel but actually it's deep deep down almost where those shells were for the guns protected by the thick armor 
of the Belfast waste. Oh, yeah. So there's lots of surprises for visitors to see. When they come on board, they are encouraged to explore and try and put together all the different stories that the ship holds. Amazing. Oh, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for guiding us through this amazing museum. This was a, such a pleasure. Uh, like this page if you want to see more videos like this. Check out the museum whenever you're in London. This is the HMS Belfast. I'm Ariel with Urbanist. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Have a great day, everyone. And I usually do a wave goodbye. If you want to join me? Ah, neat. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>